her 9000's game room. Okay, so this is a game that I've wanted to talk about for quite a while. I wanted to talk about it, but I figured that I had to hold it back until I'd already talked about it and made a video on Starway, otherwise known as Star Fox. So with that out of the way quite a while ago, and quite a long gap since then, I'm here to talk about Stunt Race FX, or Wild Tracks as it was known in Japan. To sum it up quickly, Stunt Race FX was a 3D cartoon style racing game developed by Nintendo EAD with assistance from Argonaut Software. It was of course published by Nintendo themselves. Nintendo originally wanted to make a franchise out of Stunt Race FX, but this idea was dropped. A sequel on the Nintendo 64 called Boogie Boogie was planned and I think work even began on it, but it was cancelled. Which I honestly think is a crying shame, as this game had a flavour which in my opinion made it very different from other racing games, and this is part of the reason for me being eager to review it. The story of Stunt Race really starts back in 1991. Nintendo began developing a custom 3D cartridge chip called the Super FX chip with Argonaut software, so that this could be used in Super NES games to create polygonal 3D graphics. The first game that used the Super FX chip was Starwing, otherwise known as Star Fox, which obviously became a big success and birthed a whole franchise that still exists to this day. After the release of Star Fox, Nintendo and Argonaut began experimenting with what else they could do with a Super FX chip. A title began to take shape originally referred to as FX Tracks, a polygon based 3D animated racing game featuring both stunts and racing. This was the type that would go on to become Stunt Race FX. When looking at Stunt Race FX, at first you would think you have a pretty standard racing game. There are a number of circuits, there are time trials, there is a selection of vehicles, but stick with me and I'll talk about the game, what it has to offer and why I think it's more than just a standard racing game. Ok so let's start with the vehicles themselves, the vehicle roster is not that big, in fact in some ways it's more like the selection you'd expect from a walk along beat em up, in the way that each choice is strong in one trait while being a little weaker in another. You have the monster truck with massive tyres, high acceleration and the ability to drive through patches of water without it affecting you, but with the disadvantage of having a low top speed. Then there's a little yellow coupe, which in all honesty can be described as the nice average vehicle, an average rate of acceleration, an average top speed. Last but not least there's a red Formula 1 type of car. This car has the highest top speed but has slow acceleration. Ok I guess this is a spoiler but it's not exactly a big one. There is also an unlockable vehicle, a motorcycle, which breaks the above rules in that it is basically good at everything. It could be criticised for being overpowered but it is an absolute blast to play with. There's also a large semi trailer that is driven from a fixed three quarter perspective. It's obviously slow to move and turns slowly as this kind of vehicle would, but don't worry you're not racing with it. This is used for a sort of bonus level so it's a kind of nice bit of something different thrown into break up proceedings. One of the problems with early 3D games like this was that they never looked realistic. Sure they tried to look realistic but the very square cars and such built from obvious wire framed style shapes. Quite frankly it was pretty much a waste of time trying to be too realistic back then, and that's why I love stunt race effects, it sods realism and makes itself into a giant cartoon. Yes the cars are made of basic shapes and it's obvious, but the game embraces this by putting large eyeballs on all of the cars, roughly where the headlights would usually go. And I'm not talking about painted on flat lifeless eyes, no these are active cartoon eyes which blink and look around, they are so active and full of emotion that they bring the cars to life. I know it might sound silly, but this really made me warm to the game. Maybe it's the fact I grew up on things like Thomas the Tank Engine and Tugs, so I've been pre-programmed to like vehicles that have been given eyes and personality, who knows. But I certainly think it's a graphical style which helps give the game a nice warm feeling. Ok so the game itself consists of three championships, which consist of four racers and a bonus level each. Now. You would think that for each race you get given a certain number of points and then where you come in the championship and if you can progress on to the next one or not is determined by your points total. Well this is not how it is done at all, no basically your finishing times are added together with the quickest best total time winning. Now the courses are split up into different areas, there's a mountain area, a city area etc and they are filled with changes in elevation and the odd hazard things like falling rocks for example. Then you have half pipes which if you hit wrongly can send your car flying over the edge of the course. On top of this there are a few which have pieces 
missing out of them, which make you have to ride along the side of them to stop yourself falling over. You have a damage meter and if you take enough damage from hitting walls or other cars or hazards, then your car will explode, but don't worry there are red crystals that you can drive over to refill your meter. If you do take too much damage, and this happens though, you'll be forced to restart the level. There is also a boost meter, which works just how it sounds. Press your boost button and you go faster, but the meter drains. If you're skillful, you can use this carefully to maximise its potential. There are also blue crystals which appear on the track, and if you manage to collect these, they will refill your boost bar. The game controls well, everything is nice and simple, you have one button for acceleration, a button to brake, you steer with the d-pad and the shoulder buttons help you to perform tighter turns, then there's the boost button and a button that toots your horn and makes you hop. Used correctly at the right moment this can be used to help you bounce over the opposition. Now you've probably noticed that for a game called Stunt Race FX I haven't actually made much mention of stunts. Well, as well as racing there are stunt tracks, there are four of them to be precise. Each of these stunt tracks begins with you in the back of a semi and as you running through segments of the course collecting stars. There are a bunch of obstacles ranging from simple mounds to elevated platforms that you have to deal with. You have to manage to collect every star before the timer counts down in order to unlock the next course. This can be quite hard as to reach certain stars you will need to be travelling at the right speed and at the right angle to make a jump that will take you to an otherwise unreachable platform which has a star on it. There's also a bit where you're in a sort of mini demolition derby with the goal being for you to ram three other cars until they blow up in the quickest time possible. Now I guess I've been going on about this game in a quite excited manner. This was after all a game I got nice and early, I got an import copy before it was even out here and I played the living heck out of it, but I'm not completely blind to its faults, I will admit that it does have some. After all I hate people who deny the faults of any company or any product, so even though I love this game let's talk about these faults. I said that I like the cartoony way the game looks, but it has to be noted that it's a bit of a slow game at least as far as frames per second go. The game only floats at around 15 frames per second. I guess this is because the graphics and what's on show actually required a lot of grunt work from both the Super Nintendo itself and the FX chip, and it's noticeable. Now when you grow up playing games in the PAL region you kind of get used to the idea that your game is not going to fill all of the screen but Stunt Race Effect's main viewing area is very small, in fact it only accounts for about half of your full screen. It's also important to mention that even though the game has a two player mode, but obviously your playing area is stupendously small during this, making it very hard to play two player unless you have a TV big enough not to care, which I suppose isn't too much of a problem nowadays for most people. But no matter the size of your screen you're going to notice that the already slow frame rate drops even more in two player mode. Given this I don't think it makes a very good two player game really. I also think that this game is a little bit disappointing in the sound department. It's not like the musical sound effects are like nails on a chalkboard though, it's more like they're just a bit plain, a bit average, fit for purpose but ultimately forgettable. Ok before I give a rating I want to talk just a little bit more about Nintendo and Argonaut. So with the team of Nintendo and Argonaut hitting gold again, even if not commercially, this team must have gone from strength to strength, right? Argonaut and Nintendo had done some good business together, true. Star Fox had been huge even if Stunt Race was not quite as big, but unfortunately it was not a team which would go the distance. Argonaut pitched a 3D game starring Yoshi to Nintendo, even going so far as to mock up a prototype for it. However, Nintendo did not accept the pitch. One Argonaut employee speculated that this was because the company did not want to let third parties use its characters, which might have been the case, but if that was true then this is something that has clearly changed with Nintendo entrusting titles to the likes of Retro with the Metroid series nowadays. Rather than accepting defeat though and simply putting their idea to bed, Argonaut decided to retool the prototype, turning it into an original game that would go on to become Croc Legend of the Gobos on PlayStation 1. Bad blood seems to have originated between Argonaut and Nintendo over two issues. One was Nintendo's refusal to pick up the Yoshi pitch, the other was the cancellation of the nearly completed Star Fox 2, which Argonaut had done a lot of work on and were apparently not paid a penny for. Members of Argonaut have claimed that the Yoshi game prototype influenced Super Mario 64, with claims that Shigeru Miyamoto actually made some form of apology for ripping their idea off. Add to this that it has been claimed a bunch of Star Fox 2's ideas and even code 
were implemented in future Nintendo games, both Star Fox and non Star Fox related, or without any acknowledgement or payment. Let's just put it this way, if even a fraction of this is true, Nintendo were basically being dicks. Let's remember at this time they'd agreed to do business with Sony to then backstep them and run to Philips, which I think kind of does make this all sound believable. I think this whole situation is a real shame, as I think together, Argonaut and Nintendo could have done so much more. Okay, back to Stump Wraith's FX. I would give the game 8 out of 10. Yes, it is not without its faults. I would have liked to have seen a sequel which addressed some of these, but alas, it was not to be. The game has its limitations, but it's a darn fun game, full of charm, and this would make me strongly recommend it. One of the best things about it is, if you own an actual SNES, and you want to get yourself a copy of the game, then it doesn't actually cost very much at all. If you look around, you can get car-only copies, with prices starting at about £6. And the truth is, usually games this cheap on the Super Nintendo nowadays tend to be the ones that are either sports titles, or just generally completely poor. Now I also have to admit that this was a great game to review and really get my teeth into because although the SNES has a large library of games, not all of them have massive stories or facts around them which are worth conveying. Trying to review a large library of SNES games can be a very hard task, especially when there is so little to say about some games. This has really been one of the factors that has held me back in my challenge of reviewing 150 games. Some of them you just have so little to say about. It's great to have a game like this, which there's so much to talk about with not only the game, but the history around it. Okay, I hope you've enjoyed this review, and that's Kerr9000 signing off, saying keep on gaming.